All right. So let's get this started just to kick off. Um, I'm Cindy Matsuki. I'm the SBR program manager for HTC. HTC is a um, agency, attached agency to DBED, and our mission is to help grow the tech and manufacturing industry in Hawaii. We have support programs and grant programs. Um, we offer a lot of services to help grow these companies and diversify our economy. Um, and one of our biggest and strongest programs is the SBIR matching grant program. And so we try and bring in experts to talk about SBIR programs and to help Hawaii companies win more SBIRs. And um, the so just in case you don't know, Hawaii has a matching grant. So if you do get awarded a federal SBIR program, please remember that uh, HTDC administers the state's matching grant where we match up to half of your SBIR for phase ones, that's up to 75,000 and for phase twos and threes, that's up to 500,000. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Rex Jacobovitz. I've known him for a really long time and I'm so glad he could join us today. He's been super successful with winning SBIRs and he's actually um, even been on the scoring committee or the review committee for SBIRs for NIH. And so I think he's got a lot of great inside tips to share. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And let's get started. If you can, if you're able to share your screen. Okay. Thank you so much, Cindy. Appreciate the intro. Uh, I'm excited to share some of my wisdom with you guys. And um, I look forward to uh, answering any questions that you might have. Uh, if you uh, if you want to uh, ask a question as I'm going along, just uh, raise your hand using the Zoom uh, hand raise feature. I saw Raju had a question right off the top. Um, did I say your name right? Yes, you did. Thank you, Rex. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Just a question. Uh, if I'm moving to Hawaii, but I'm not there yet, am I able to work with you guys? So uh, that would be a question for HTDC. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure that that uh, go ahead, Cindy, if you have a, a quick response to that. Yeah. So as far as if you have a federal SBIR, you need to be registered as a Hawaii business to qualify for the matching grant. And so you have to have all your ducks in a row as far as being a, um, yeah, being a business that's operating in Hawaii and majority of the work for your SBIR must be done in Hawaii as well to qualify for the state match. Okay, that's perfect. That's what I thought. Thank you. I'm on the right track. Awesome. Congratulations. I think it's possible based on that last question that some of the participants may not understand that HTDC just gives matching grants when you already have a phase one SBR grant. If you could explain that to make sure everybody's got that, yeah. that might help at this point. They may think you're an independent grant agent. Mm. Yes, thank you for the clarification. Yes. yes. So That's this does provide a matching grant, which means we will match your current federal award for SBIR. Thanks, Tim. Um, that being said, HCC does have events uh, and webinars like this where everybody is invited to attend and you know get assistance in uh, helping to, uh, to prepare to, to write your SBIR and um, as well as networking um, uh, events. Uh, there was a good conference just a few months ago um, where they had uh, the program officials from a bunch of uh, agencies come and uh, be be available for one-on-one -on -one meetings with people, uh, and it was um, I met, made a lot of good connections there. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kick off. I'm going to start by uh, giving you a little bit of background of who I am and uh, why uh, I'm in this position to share some advice with you guys. Um, starting with sharing my screen. Okay, uh, can you see my screen good? All right, I am 
Rex Jakobowicz, the president of Motivity. We are a software startup. We offer a software as a service to clinics that treat kids with autism using behavioral therapy. So there's about 1.7 million kids in the US with autism, about 180,000 of them are receiving this behavioral therapy, which consists of intensive one-on-one -on -one sessions where a tutor works with the kid to help uh, learn skills and shape their behaviors. And it's a very data intensive process. They uh, collect data hundreds of times an hour about the kid's performance on different tasks, such as uh, making eye contact when their name is called, things like that. So we have replaced the uh, paperwork with uh, software that runs on a tablet or a phone. And we also uh, built a tool that allows the behavior analyst who has a master's degree in knowing how to create good uh, programs for these kids, we created a tool for them to construct their own user interfaces and programs and workflows so that the tutor can just follow what the uh, what their um, interface is prompting them to do. And based on the data, it changes what happens. There's also the ability to assign uh, programs to parents so they can, on their phone, be reminded to do certain tasks with the kid throughout the week uh, in between sessions and um, thereby contribute to the behavioral intervention themselves. This is a rapidly growing area. Uh, the analysts are called BCBA's board certified behavior analysts and there's um, close to 60,000 of them now. Uh, and the uh, tutors, which are called registered behavior technicians, there's over 100,000 of them. Uh, spread across the country in 4,000 clinics. Many of these clinics are consolidating into chains of clinics. And uh, our software as a service is sold by the number of patients each clinic has, uh, $20 per patient per month. So if a clinic has 100 patients, they'd be uh, giving us $2,000 a month to use our software. We've seen uh, rapid growth in the last year. We launched this commercially in uh, mid-2021. And last year, we had almost a 600% increase to 150 clinics. And um, the footprint of those clinics is uh, almost 4,000 kids with autism that are using our software. And all of our sales and marketing has been through uh, going to some conferences and um, a little bit of social media posts. We've got Instagram and Facebook channels, as well as um, primarily word of mouth from our customers. We have a great team. There's about uh, 16 of us, uh, half our uh, employees and the other half are consultants and they're scattered uh, in Hawaii and across the US. Um, the, uh, everybody works from home. So we are a, a virtual software company and uh, we have uh, people in uh, support, uh, answering user questions and helping get them uh, on, uh, implemented, as well as our engineers and um, one or two salespeople. So uh, here's my background. I came to Hawaii in uh, the early 70s as a little kid. Uh, I grew up in Aina Haina. I went to Kalani High School and uh, UH Manoa. Then I left for the mainland and spent most of the 90s getting my PhD in computer science. And right when I was uh, graduating, I met the program official for NIH SBIR at a conference. I was presenting my dissertation work and he told me about SBIR and recommended that I uh, go for it. So I uh, wrote a grant while still a grad student and it was awarded a phase one, uh, $99,000. I was so excited to have that uh, money. I felt like I was the richest man on the planet. I used that to found my company. And uh, I called it Vivalog. We built software for radiologists. Um, and in the um, five years or so, or I guess eight years that I was running that company, we also got uh, a phase two and then another uh, fast track for a total of about two million. Uh, and that was enough to uh, grow our business to the point where we were acquired at an early stage 
by McKesson Corporation, one of the uh, biggest companies on the planet. Um, and I was a VP at McKesson for five years, running a solution line of hospital software, seeing how the big boys do it. Um, and after a few years of that, I realized that my passion and my talents were in uh, being an entrepreneur, and I knew how to get grants. So I, uh, nights and weekends, dove into the field of autism because I had some friends working in that space, and they showed me there was a need for technology there, and uh, built a prototype and submitted a proposal and got awarded a new phase one SBIR and founded Motivity with that. That was in uh, 2013. So I've been doing this for uh, almost nine years at this new startup. And the first uh, five years or so was really just about building out technology uh, using SBIR funds, um, um, trying them out, trying to find something that worked right. And then only in the past couple of years have we been um, actually commercializing it. And over these uh, eight years, I received a total of four uh, phase two SBIRs. Um, I'm most proud of the third one here because uh, it got a perfect score from the reviewers, which is uh, the first time I've ever heard of that happening. Uh, so um, uh, that's my uh, my claim to fame. And um, I'm here to share with you some of the tips that I use when I'm writing a proposal. Thanks, Raju, for that uh, uh, cheering on there. Yes. Um, so that's my story. Um, also, uh, over the last 20 years or so, I have been a regular SBIR reviewer, and I think that's been critical to my understanding of what uh, what needs to go into a good proposal um, so that I uh, can get into the mindset of the reviewer while I'm writing it and imagine what types of questions that the reviewer is going to ask. I think that's really important that you anticipate those questions while you're writing your grant. And so that's what the rest of this talk is going to be about, uh, tips on, on how to write your grant. I can also uh, spend time at the end answering um, more technical questions about the process. Um, all right, so I think um, you're probably aware of uh, the purpose of SBIR. Uh, there's two main purposes. One is to fund the creation of innovative products and services that are relevant to the Institute's mission. So my grants have come from the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, it's important that you figure out which institute is most um, uh, the best fit for your uh, proposal in your um, area. The, the NIH institutes are organized around um, um, body parts or diseases, disease types. So there's one for communication disorders and deafness and one for mental health and uh, uh, one for cancer. So uh, find the right one and uh, make sure that what you're proposing is, is relevant to their mission. If it's cancer, it's pretty obvious. Uh, anything that's going to help uh, humans beat cancer. Uh, and then the second major purpose of SBIR is to foster economic growth. So um, the, the goal here is to create jobs um, nationwide, and it has created many, many jobs since the program was first started in the 80s. Uh, and so each um, federal agency is required to take about 3% of their budget that um, they normally have uh, previously all allocated towards large research institutions. Um, and they, they're in this um, SBIR program requires them to take 3% of that and give it to small businesses. So uh, what does it mean to be a small business? Well, you got to have less than 500 employees. And if you're majority owned by another company, then that parent company has to have less than 500 employees. Uh, that goes for investors as well. Uh, if you have an investor that owns more than 50% of your company, that investor and all of their holdings has to have less than 500 employees. Uh, secondly, the PI, that's the principal investigator. That could be you. Um, that's, that person must be at least 51% employee employed by the business at the time that the grant is awarded. And it's important to know that you don't necessarily need to be 51% employed at the time you apply for the grant. But if uh, you get the money, you need to quit whatever other job you're doing and be at least 51% employed by your business. Um, so that 3% of the budget is a lot. Um, 
It's three, it's over 3 billion awarded annually across all uh, agencies. Um, the biggest is DOD. And I think a lot of the uh, HTDC recipients are DOD recipients. Um, the, the big conferences are, are mostly DOD people there. Um, but there is uh, NIH, which is part of Health and Human Services, has a very significant component as well, uh, 1 billion given away. So these two together make up almost 80% of all of the SBIR, and the rest is you know, National Science Foundation and other smaller uh, organizations. So in NIH, there's about 1,000 new SBIRs awarded every year. So um, that's a lot that you know, um, every state has dozens. Uh, and uh, the, uh, there's the phase one where you show feasibility. Um, it's for six months, about 150,000 or so. I actually go into more detail there. And the phase two where you actually develop the prototype. Uh, and uh, one thing that's important to note is, although it's not, it's not easy to win an SBIR, it's actually a lot easier than it is to win a regular R01 research grant. Uh, the, the academics that are battling in the universities for these uh, main research grants, which are called R01s, they're looking at pay lines that are like less than 10%. Uh, for SBIR, the pay line for phase one, meaning what percentage of all applicants get their grant, is 15 to 18 percent for NIH and 20 percent for DOD. So um, that, there's, there is a barrier there. You can't expect it to be easy, but it's better than 10 percent. Um, also, once you have your phase one, there's a really high chance you're going to get your phase two. And that's because it's filtering. Um, a lot of the phase one grants that come in are just not that great. And people don't really know what they're doing and they submit weak grants. And so about half of them aren't even going to get considered. The reviewer can tell as soon as they look at it that this is not going to not going to happen. And then of the remaining half, you know, you've got a good, a good chance, uh, a good chance of getting funded there. Um, once you've passed through that gate, then you can get a phase two because you've already proven yourself to be worthy and to know what you're doing. And um, so the, the pay lines are much higher for those. Hey, Rex, can I jump in? Yes. Laurel has a question. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I will unmute myself. So if you could please explain the difference. Um, so, you know, there are all these portals that you have to enter. NIH has their portion. I've been working specifically with NIOSH and CDC for some time now and have just actually put a request forward. However, I'm still a little confused as to how they cooperate and or if they do. Um, I was told by one of the people I'm speaking with to, you know, make sure you tick the box that says you want CDC and NI and CDC and um, NIOSH to review. But it seemed like the only thing I saw when I was putting um, or submitting was the NIH portion. So mm -hmm. I'm not really clear how the separation works there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um uh, the, the process of applying itself is, is complicated and there are a lot of check boxes and a lot of um, forms to fill out. And um, I don't really know the answer to your specific question. That would involve sort of looking at the screen that you're on and trying to figure out what to do. Um, I, uh, I know that when I submit my grants, there is a place where I specify NIMH. Um, so I, I just, I just can't remember exactly where that is. Yeah. But I just, the, the grant has, um, when you're done and you submit it, it's got, you know, 200 pages, <laughs> yeah. even though the research plan is, is only, you know, potentially five or six pages if it's phase one. Uh, but the, um, uh, so I'm, uh, my goal here is to talk about the bigger picture and give tips on how to write a good research plan, uh, and Perfect. what, what are some of the other components that are important, like uh, your investigators? Um, I'm, I'm not going to be able to give um, a lot of technical advice about where to find a particular checkbox when you're applying for the grant. Right. Yeah, um, I didn't mean to put make it as a technical question. I guess I was thinking about the relationships between CDC, NIH, and NIOSH. You know, they are, Jump in, that's Laurel. Yeah. And yes. Rex, sorry. I just wanted to make a note that we have um, Kenneth Kim, actually. And he's in one of the departments at NIH. He's with NIAD. Um, if you want to jump in and say anything or 
maybe we can share your contact info later if you want to throw it in the chat if people can connect with you um right. directly that would be thank great you. kenneth thank, thank you. you yeah sure um <laughs> so I, I will drop my email in the uh, uh the chat momentarily here but um you know the, the way it's set up at at least at nih um is that uh, we have sort of a central repository called the Center for Scientific Review. Um, so all of our SBI, our applications go to uh, CSR first, who then uh, distributes it, um, you know, based off of mission fit. Um, and um, so while uh, you are able to indicate which institute you would like your um, application to end up at, um, it's ultimately up to CSR uh, you know, who will uh, sort of distribute it um, as uh, as they see fit. Um, you know, I'm not sure uh, how um, CDC and uh, NIOSH play into that, but um, at least here at NIH, uh, that is the way we are set up. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Guys. My pleasure. Thank you for that. I appreciate that as well. So uh, why do you want SBIR? Uh, I have a quick question, Rex. Yes. Uh, when you were doing the SBIR uh, phase one for your company, uh, were you able to show a strong commercial viability and when, with, your, with your phase or was it in a later phase that you were able to show that? Um, Thank that's you. a great question. Uh, phase. Phase one, uh, the, the reviewers take a, um, a lighter approach to analyzing your commercialization capability. Uh, you do not need to be um, focused on that in that proposal. There does need to be an indicator that, the, that there is commercial potential for this and you should definitely talk about it, but you don't need to make it a major part of the proposal. That comes in phase two. In phase two, there's um, a, a section called the commercialization plan. Uh, which is where you go all out describing uh, essentially your business plan, um, uh, how you're going to make money, and um, why there's a market for this. And uh, it's uh, during the phase two process, the uh, reviewers are much more uh, uh, scrutinizing your commercialization capability. That being said, I have seen uh, phase ones get shot down because there just didn't seem to be any uh, strong commercialization that the reviewers could, could imagine. They're like, you know, this is such a, uh, a small niche or a really uh, small offshoot. And that, and that usually comes into play with the critique of the uh, significance. Uh, if, you know, if it's not going to have much of a commercial impact, it's probably not that significant. Uh, those go kind of hand in hand in a way. Um, uh, but you definitely need to think about it and have that uh, as part of what you're, what you're planning to do, because ultimately these grants are about building a business in the end. Thank you for that. Yeah, I will say that there are a lot of companies out there that offer um, uh, that basically build products that have very, very low revenue um, that uh, consistently get new SBIRs. Some of them have even gotten a um, hundred or more SBIRs over their lifetime. Uh, and they're basically um, in the business of doing research and putting out little products like a CD or something like that. You know, maybe their product is a is a uh, a website where you can go and get some training materials. So um, uh, there is a, uh, a low bar in terms of commercialization compared to what you would see if you're taking your business plan to a VC, a venture capital. Uh, it's not the same level of scrutiny. Uh, the nice thing about SBR compared to that uh, uh, other investors is that you don't have to dilute the company. When I sold my first startup, Vivalog, I owned 100% of the company plus a, a small amount that my employees owned. Um, there were no investors to pay off there. So um, that's a really, really important aspect of this. Uh, it also gives you visibility and credibility uh, in the eyes of investors or your, uh, your customers. Um, if it's a DOD, it allows you to establish a sole source position with the feds for your product. You're basically building something that they want and then they're buying it from you. NIH is very different. NIH doesn't do that. Um, that's the major difference between the two. You're not, you, at the end of this, you better have something that is gonna, uh, that you're gonna sell to 
a market, not just to NIH. Uh, there's no penalties for failure, uh, which means you can do high risk stuff. Um, and uh, there's no obligations other than fulfilling the grant research, which you, you need to do what you say you're going to do. Um, and uh, the government does have the right to get a royalty free license to whatever technology you develop. Um, but they, I don't think they've ever exercised that right. And if they only can exercise it in the event of like a national emergency, let's say, for example, you're developed a a new type of vaccine, and now there's a pandemic that needs that vaccine, and you're refusing to give it, uh, to commercialize it for some reason, they can go and appropriate it because they funded it. But that is a super rare edge case. So I uh, talked a little bit about you needing to be a small business, needing to be 51% uh, owned. Okay, this is important. 51% owned by uh, US citizens or another small business. It can be multiple VCs that own it, but um, you can't be more than 50% owned by a single VC. So that's one way to kind of get around that limitation. I already talked about that. I'm not going to talk about STTR, but uh, that's if you are going to be closely partnering with an academic institution or some other large research institution, uh, then you can get an STTR which means some of the budget goes to the research institution and some of it goes to you. It's like a consortium between you and that research institution. Um, the, uh, there is a, a much larger uh, amount of money going towards SBIR than STTR, so I'm not going to talk much about it, but it's definitely there for you. Um, I do work with uh, research institutions, but I do it as an SBIR and I hire the uh, academics at the research institution as um, consultants that works really well for the type of stuff that we do as opposed to an STTR. Phase one is to demonstrate feasibility. You're building a proof of concept and testing it. Uh, it's typically anywhere from six months to two years and under 300,000 in total costs. That budget is just a guideline. Different agencies have um, uh, potentially higher uh, guidelines or higher limits than that. Uh, phase two is where you show effectiveness. You're building and testing a full prototype, typically one to three years and typically under two million in total costs. Phase three is commercialization. And this is where we're the big difference between DOD and NIH. DOD, phase three, they give you a lot of money. NIH, phase three, you got to go sell your thing to the market. There is no grant funds for that. All there are like, um, uh, there's a type of a uh, phase two add-on grant you can get, um, but um, I think those are pretty rare. Hello, Rex. Uh, yes. Can you be a partnership? For example, my wife and I, we're partners. We own 50% each, but I'm an American citizen. She's Australian. Uh, that, I think the requirement, the requirement is 51% owned by U.S. citizens, so you would need to own more than her. <laughs> uh, so a partnership I, would not be allowed then. Uh, well, you could own fifty-one and have her own forty-nine, maybe. Okay. I'm not sure right. about the details there, but that's the, uh, these are my understandings based on um, over the years, uh, my, my exposure to SBIR and, and reading about them. You know, um, I've never I've never had a um, situation where uh, we had non-U.S. citizens as owners of my company. So I'm not sure. I'm not an official uh, uh, spokesperson for SBIR in any way here. I'm just a recipient of SBIR giving you my what I know about it. Okay, uh, I, I can actually jump in on that one. Um, yeah, you, you would need to have the company be primarily owned by a U.S. citizen. Um, typically, uh, it's, um, you, you know, we really try to keep it um, to, you know, uh, uh, U.S. citizens, um, you know, because this is a, you know, government funded small business program, um, you know, funds need to stay within the U.S. And so that can be uh, a little tricky. Um, and then also with uh, the recent reauthorization, there are some new regulations coming out about um, uh, foreign involvement, uh, which we're still trying to uh, uh, 
I guess, interpret from the SBA. Uh, just the NIH as a whole is still uh, sort of in a holding pattern uh, regarding uh, these new, um, you know, sort of uh, regulations about foreign involvement. Um, so for the time being, I would say, uh, yes, you know, at least 51%. Um, and two is, if you are interested in uh, pursuing this further, um, you know, connect with a program official, um, you know, to, to kind of discuss your particular situation. And you need to be in business for a whole year, isn't that correct, too? Not necessarily, no. I've never okay. heard that one. Um, I, I will make a, make a mention since we're talking about foreign aspect here. Uh, there's a stipulation, which I probably should put on this slide, which is um, uh, all of the work that's being performed under the grant has to be performed on U.S. soil. So you cannot take uh, a chunk of your grant and, and pay for offshore developers, for example. Um, that actually is very important for us because we do have um, an offshore developer and we're planning expanding in that regard, uh, and we cannot use grant funds for that person. We have to use our, um, our profit from our um, uh, other operations. That being said, there is a component of every grant, 7% of the grant is considered a fixed fee profit for the company. Um, so you want to build that into your budget. I talk a little bit about budget later, but with that 7% profit, you can do whatever you want with that money. Um, and I'll just say, since we're talking about restrictions and how you can spend the money, um, you're, you're restricted, um, not just US soil, but there's some other things. There's certain costs that are unallowable. So for example, you cannot use SBIR grants for sales and marketing. Uh, uh, I don't think you can use your SBIR grants to pursue a patent. Uh, you need separate funds for that. Um, uh, you, you can't use your SBIR funds to uh, perform a legal defense uh, if someone's suing you for something. Um, so you are, you are restricted. However, there, um, um, and that includes your indirect funds. And I'm gonna talk more about budget later if we have time, but uh, there's your direct funds, which are these are the specific costs of this grant um, that we're gonna be doing work for this grant. Uh, I'm paying this person hourly or part of their salary to do the work of the grant. That's a direct cost. There's also, um, I am buying this computer to use for this grant and it's, it's just for this grant, that's a direct cost. But if you have, you, you can also have indirect costs where you know for every dollar of direct cost, you have a certain amount of indirect that you get. And I'll talk about how you determine that amount, but then you can use that to pay for your rent or for a computer that's used for other purposes. Um, you can use it for your accountant and for, uh, you know, for legal fees that are not about defending your uh, lawsuit. So there's, so you got to know what's allowable and what's not allowable. You can have, you can pay for travel expenses. You can't pay for alcohol. So you got to split out your drinks separate on your tab. There's all kinds of um, accounting that you have to do to, uh, to be compliant with government grant regulations. And um, I, I have a company that I use that helps me with that called Reliascent. Um, and they, uh, they provide me with um, our accounting services and bookkeeping and um, help us to make sure that we're compliant with those rules. And if you get more than a certain amount of, uh, I think it's 750 in direct costs in a year, you then are subject to uh, what's called a yellow book audit where you have to hire an auditor to come and you know, randomly ask for receipts for things and look at all your books and they will give you their stamp of approval that you're doing everything right or tell you what you need to fix. So pretty complicated. Um, uh, you have to be prepared for that. That being said, uh, the, the focus of this talk really is more about how to write a good grant. Once you have the grant, you can spend time figuring out how to deal with all that stuff. Uh, so here's where I was talking briefly about budget. Um, I talked about labor uh, as being direct, if it's on grant specific activities. Um, then there's indirect costs. There's the fringe, which is, for example, vacation, paid time off that you're paying people, um, and, and time that they're spending on things that are not directly uh, for a grant. Also, you know, health insurance and benefits. There's also overhead, for example, your rent, um, or maybe you have a secretary. Those are all indirect costs, and you can apply grant funds to those. Um, and the way that works is you propose an indirect rate to the government. Um, my, uh, our company has a 25% fringe rate applied to employee labor. So um, uh, for every dollar of employee labor, we get 25 cents that can be applied towards the fringe costs for that employee. 
we also have an additional 40% applied to all direct costs, including labor. So if the vast majority of our grant expense is employee labor, which it is, then we're getting roughly 65 cents for every dollar of direct cost. Um, all of this uh, you need to understand when you're putting together your budget for your grant application. So um, you should, uh, you could probably work with someone like um, Reliacent that I work with to get to help you understand how to put together your budget. Um, then there's that 7% fixed fee profit. So the total cost is the direct plus the indirect plus the fixed fee. And um, you're typically working backwards because the, uh, the agency is going to tell you what their guidelines are. Maybe you talk to the program, program official and ask, could I, could I get a $1.8 million grant? And they'll say, okay, fine. And then you have to work backwards to make sure your total meets that $1.8 million. So you put, put together a spreadsheet and you plug in your direct labor costs uh, and it computes what your fringe is. And then you put in what your other costs are, including, for example, consultants that you're paying. Uh, and then uh, from that, you compute what your indirect is uh, and what your fixed fee is and what your total cost is. And then you go play with the numbers until it comes under the, the budget that you're trying to get. That's, that's typically how this works. Um, so uh, of course, you can also just ask for the money that you think you need and work, work from it that way, uh, which um, uh, you, oftentimes the program officials will be uh, willing to uh, allow you to have a larger budget based if you tell them like we need a budget this size. So um, this is application process. You pick a topic and you generate an idea. Uh, it's good to read the abstracts of prior award winners if you really want to get a sense of uh, uh, what other people are doing in your space. Um, let me find this. So if you go to sbir.gov, uh, you can then search for a keyword. So for example, I'm going to search for, uh, I was thinking about writing a grant to take our technology and apply it to speech and language pathology, uh, which is an adjacent market. So um, I would search for those keywords and it would show me out of about uh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand grants, it shows me there's six that have the word speech language pathology in them. And I can uh, click on this and uh, see who it was awarded to, when it was awarded, how much it was. Uh, I even have the contact info of the principal investigator um, and I can read their uh, high level abstract of what the grant's about. So this is really great if you're um, trying to see what other people are doing in your space. Uh, one of the first things you want to do is contact the program official at the agency. Uh, and usually uh, you can search SBIR program official and the agency name, and it'll just take you to a page where it's got that person's phone number and email. Um, uh, when you reach out to them, make sure that you um, uh, are well prepared to um, uh, make a good impression on them because ultimately they're going to be involved in deciding whether or not you get funded. Uh, so um, uh, that relationship is very important. So you don't want to come across as not knowing what you're talking about from, from the start. First impressions are important. Um, when I first applied for my first SBIR, uh, my, that program official who suggested it to me, I thought of him as my angel. Uh, because uh, he was there for me and helped me out. My very first application didn't get funded. He encouraged me to not give up and um, have been batting a thousand ever since. So uh, that's a very important relationship. You want to start with them. Don't go too far down the road without talking to them first. You want to ask them, is this something that would be of high priority for you? That's the main question. Uh, so you really want to start early on recruiting the people that are going to be part of your grant. Um, and uh, you need to get letters of support from them. Uh, it's very important that you have technical and scientific expertise in the topic that your grant is about. Um, so if you're saying you're going to build some software uh, to, to help therapists who treat kids with autism, you'd better have therapists uh, on your team who are going to uh, provide the uh, uh, the authoritative voice that what you're doing is important, um, not just uh, not just you know potential customers, but but also that they're going to help guide how it's built. Uh, furthermore, 
you want to have some uh, people who have research experience on your team. So that usually means a PhD. So what I often do, like, for example, if I'm thinking about writing a grant in speech and language pathology, I'm going to go into the speech and language pathology research community. I'm going to read their journals. I'm going to find out who's doing stuff similar to what I'm going to what I'm proposing or who could benefit from it. Maybe they're they have a new type of intervention that requires uh, a lot of complex uh, uh, data collection and, and they could use our software. So I then reach out to them. I go through my network and contacts. I find people who would be willing to collaborate with me. I sell them on my idea and I get them to agree to be a uh, consultant to write a letter. Um, and now all of a sudden the reviewer is going to see, oh, look, they got this premier speech and language pathology PhD researcher on their team that checks a little box in their mind. We, we have that person. Uh, it really helps if the principal investigator has a PhD. Uh, it's actually pretty rare for uh, NHSBR to be funded where it's not a PhD principal investigator, but it does happen. It does happen. Um, but uh, you might want to consider having, uh, if you don't have a PhD, having someone with a PhD agree to be your co-investigator, for example, or at least prominently featured in the grant proposal. Um, and, and that is, um, uh, I just can't stress enough how important it is to have that, that research component on your team because I've seen so many grants get shut down because they were a great idea, but they just didn't seem to have the right people pulled in. Now, if, if this uh, person who is a PhD and you want them to be your, your co-PI, they need to be 51% employed by the company. That's kind of tricky if they're working for a university, for example. Uh, but if they're willing to jump on board with you, then you got to get them to write a letter saying that they would if you got funded. Um, but most of the time, you're just getting consultants, in which case, by the way, reviewers will look to see how much uh, commitment is this consultant making. So they want to they're going to look at the consultant's letter to make sure that that they say they're going to be uh, putting in a certain number of hours for you. So make sure that's that, that it's not just like a small amount of hours. You want to get a consultant if they're in a critical role. You want to make sure you give them like, I don't know. Um, at least 40, 50 hours, maybe, or, you know, if not a couple hundred hours, make sure that they're going to be significantly involved. And then you put that in your budget, you put it in your budget justification, and you make sure that it's in the letter from the consultant saying that they're committing to that many hours. Because otherwise, you know, people are getting people to write letters saying, yeah, sure, I'll be part of this, but they're really only going to be there for a couple of hours. After you've done all this stuff and while you're doing it, you want to write the research plan. And I can't stress enough how long it takes to write a good research plan. A phase one is only uh, uh, six pages of, uh, and a phase two is only 12 pages, but it's the meat. As a reviewer, the first thing I do when I get the 200 page grant is I skip through all of it and go straight to the research plan and read those six or 12 pages. Um, I'm pretty sure every reviewer is going to do that. Or maybe I'll look at the PIs, uh, uh, bio sketch to see who this person is. Maybe I'll look at the specific aims page, which is one page describing what they're going to do. And then I'll dive into the research plan. So I'm going to be spending uh, a bit of time talking about how to write a good research plan. And we only have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to speed up. The other major components that you need to be focused on are the budget, the budget justification, the bio sketches, uh, human subjects. If you have human subjects is a big deal. It takes a lot of work. And uh, if it's a phase two commercialization plan, there's three deadlines typically every year for SBIR. These are the deadlines, January 5th, April 5th, September 5th. So if you're just starting to think about writing a grant now, April 5th probably is too soon, I would imagine, unless you really know what you're doing and you can spit out a phase one pretty quickly. But, you know, September 5th is a more realistic deadline at this point. Um, it takes me hundreds of hours to write my grants. So uh, you submit your grant, it gets processed, you get notification right away, you're holding your fingers, hoping that it gets processed because there's, you know, the submission process is really um, complicated and uh, takes hours. Uh, and then you hope that there's no errors and you get this notification that it was processed. And yes, and you don't want to wait till the last day to do it because if there's a mistake, you want to have a few days to correct your mistake. Then it gets assigned to a scientific review group. Um, uh, that usually, it's usually assigned in the first month. However, the group doesn't necessarily meet in the first month. It might, they might meet two months later. Um, and the way this works is um, 
there are typically about three reviewers that are assigned to your grant. Uh, and they are the ones who are going to read your grant carefully, and they're going to write up critiques about it and give it scores based on its significance, innovation approach, and personnel facilities and overall score. Then all the reviewers sit around the table in a room, or now more frequently they uh, it's being done over Zoom. Um, I, I much prefer the in-person ones. Uh, and um, uh, only the grants that have been scored in the top half will get discussed. So if the three reviewers, you take their three scores, you average them, and then if it's if that average score is below the top half of all the grants in the room, it probably won't even be talked about. Unless one of the reviewers really liked it, they can rescue it and say, actually, I really do want to talk about this. So in that case, you're not even going to get an overall score. You're just going to say your grant was unscored, and here's the critiques from the three reviewers why. Don't be discouraged if that happens, especially if it's your first time submitting a grant. You need to read the reviewer's critiques and take it very seriously, resubmit it. However, if you are in the top half, what happens is um, each of those three reviewers spends like five minutes explaining bullet point what your grant's about, um, why they liked it and why they didn't like it. What are its strengths and what are its weaknesses? If they're giving it a uh, not a great score, they're gonna be focusing on the weaknesses. Uh, if they're the one that's the highest score of the three, like this person who gave it a two, they're going to be um, focusing on the strengths. So um, the, the score is between one and nine. Uh, one is perfect, best possible grant. Uh, very rarely, very rarely see those. Two is really great. Three is pretty good. Four, uh, five, uh, six, forget about it. Seven, eight, nine, no chance at all. So um, typically you'll see scores like this. One person loved it. One person thought it was just okay. And then there's a battle where the reviewers are basically saying what they liked or didn't like. Everybody else in the room is listening. There's a few rounds of questions and then everybody votes and gives it a score between one and nine. Typically people stay within the range of the reviewer. So in this case, between two and five, if you want, you if you really think that people are being too generous and you want to give it something outside of that range, you can raise your hand and say, I'm voting outside the range. They then take the scores of everybody in the room, they add them all up, they take the average and multiply that by 10, and that's your score. So if you got a bunch of a bunch of threes and fours, there's a good chance your score is going to be like a 35 or something like that. 3.5 times 10, 35. This is just a rough estimate here, but if you've got a score between 10 and 25, which is basically a reviewer score between one and two and a half, then that means you're very likely to get funded. And this is just from my, my, my experience. Uh, if you're in the 25 to 30, you still have a really good chance. I've gotten grants funded in, uh, that were 30. Um, if you're uh, between 31 and 37, you're now in the gray area. That means it's up to that program official to decide if they want to fund your grant or not. And they take your they take the grants that they want to fund and they bring it to a council and they they advocate for the grants that they want to fund and usually I think those grants get get rubber stamped or I don't know how that works but um, the 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 point is that you're very likely to be in this gray area and if you are your uh, if you are then you are definitely um, uh, hoping that your reviewers I mean your uh, program official is going to go up to bat for you. That's where that that's where that really matters. And they, you want them to feel like they're invested in you. You come to them early, you tell them about your idea, they'll give you suggestions about how to shape it. You take their suggestions, they're gonna feel more invested in you. And when they see you and another one are both in the gray area, they might pick you versus the other one where they never came to that person at all. They don't know who that person is. So I think that's important. It's kind of an insider tip, I guess. Um, but there's also a very good chance that you're not gonna get funded on your first try, in which case you get a summary statement. Uh, in the fourth month after you've submitted it. The summary statement has the written critiques and a summary of the discussion. I'm going to show you a quick example of summary statement. Oops. So here's one um, where it didn't get funded, or maybe this one did get funded, but uh, oh, this is my response to the summary statement. Here is... Here's a summary statement. So reviewer, first they um, they showed what the total score, they talked about the, the budget, that here's the score, this one got a 30. This one did get funded. Um, but uh, they, they summarized the discussion so you can see what was talked about in the room. 
would be so great to be a fly on the wall and hear what people say about your grant, but this is the closest you're going to get to that. By the way, you're not allowed to reach out to the reviewers. That is a big no-no. Uh, you do see the names of, and, and, uh, of everyone who was in the review session. You don't know who the ones that were assigned to your grant are. That's, that's a secret. And you are definitely not allowed to reach out to anybody in that. Uh, section. And if you know someone there and they're they're if they're friends with you or have a close relationship with you, they're supposed to excuse themselves from voting on your grant. They actually supposed to leave the room. Um, it's okay if you know them because you know uh, you guys worked together at some point in the past or whatever. Uh, but if they're if they're actively at the institution that you're at or you have a close relationship with them, you they they must recuse themselves. I've recused myself from a bunch of grants from people that I knew. Uh, then, Rex, can I ask you a question? Yeah. What was the difference? You said the, your first grant was not uh, funded, uh, but your second grant was. Uh, what did you learn or what, what mistake did you make in the first one, if you don't mind sharing that? Um, I'll talk about some of those later. I think uh, I just, um, I, I didn't hit the right notes, basically. Uh, I, I, I maybe... Um, one thing for sure that I didn't have enough of a clear uh, definition of how I was going to test what I was building. Um, so I was focused on what I was going to build and how I was going to build it, but then I didn't talk enough. I didn't devote enough space or detail to the um, the way I was going to show that it was feasible. So I didn't have measurable, concrete milestones that were quantitative. That's an example. I'm going to I'm going to um, Give a, an example here. Uh, here here's a um, here's a here's a, just a quick example of a weakness. Uh, the description of how this large and geographically dispersed team would be would work closely and successfully together was not sufficiently described. So we're spread out all over the country, um, and our customers and users are spread out over the country. I didn't really talk about uh, changes related to communication and implementation across such a wide network. Well, the reviewer actually missed it in this case because I did talk about those things. So after you get your uh, summary statement, the next step is for you to write, if, if the, if the uh, program official is considering funding your grant, you, they ask you to write a response to the summary statement. And this is a response, not to the reviewers because they're not gonna see it, but it's a response to, um, uh, so that they can, they can read it themselves as a program official and maybe have it as evidence as to how you met the critiques. So in this case, um, let's see if I can find that one. Uh, oh, here. So this is my response. Um, the uh, challenges related to geographically dispersed team were not adequately described. So I summarized what the what what the concern was, but then I say, actually, on page seventy four of the application, perhaps the reviewer missed this. I had a whole paragraph describing how we're going to handle that problem. We're going to travel between the offices. We're already working this way, et cetera. So. Um, so you go to every single negative point and you write down uh, how, either why the reviewers missed, missed your answer to that and you show the answer, or you say, I have fixed this problem. Um, this is what we're going to do instead. Make sure you're not just kicking everything back saying, oh, I already said it. You have to have a few where you actually say you're going to do something different. Um, you really need to take it seriously what, what the reviewers' um, comments are. So. Uh, going back to this, there's the council review, and if you're lucky, you get the notice of grant award. Uh, you're sitting, you're sitting there with your fingers crossed, waiting, waiting, and you get that email uh, notice of award uh, or notice of grant award, and and, and that's where they, uh, you basically, they, you're locked in on getting those funds, and typically won't start for another month or so. If it's a multi-year grant, they're locking you in on the first years of funds. Uh, and then you need to submit a report at the end of each year. Uh, and then uh, the, the program official will look over your report and hopefully they'll just release the next year's funds. You don't have to go through any review process, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, I don't know, um, you have to screw up pretty bad to not get your, your subsequent years. And this is for like a multi-year grant. Now, if you're doing a phase one and then later you can apply for a phase two, that's a whole new competitive uh, review process you have to go through. Uh, so the point is that once you submit the grant, it's going to be seven or eight months before you actually get the money. And if you don't get it on the first try, which is a good chance, if it's your first grant, then um, you're looking at probably a year before you see the money because you have to resubmit it. 
Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get your review score and your critique with enough time to resubmit your grant before the next cycle deadline. And I think they try hard to make that happen. Um, but you don't have much time, so you got to be prepared to devote all your time to just fixing your grant and responding to the review. If you don't get funded, you um, you resubmit your you change your grant and then you resubmit it and you uh, you have a one page introduction to the grant that explains how you're responding to the reviewers' critiques, and that's so important. You need to have bullet by bullet point as to how you're responding, what you've done to to make the grant better. That's different from that letter that I was referring to. This is a, it's limited to one page and it's part of your resubmission. Okay, uh, I'm unfortunately running out of time right at the most important part. So I'm just gonna fly through this. I can't take any questions on this, but the, the, the main components of the grant are this. The, um, the research plan is six pages for a phase one and 12 pages for a phase two. The significance is why this is important. The innovation is what we're going to, that's where you describe what you're going to do, uh, what you're building, what, you know, what's, what's different about it. The approach is how you're going to do it. And the investigators are going to, who's, who are going to uh, do the work. Uh, does the specific aims define clear, appropriate, measurable goals? Um, is the significance addressing an important problem? Is it going to advance scientific knowledge? You really want to be aiming high here. You really want to be changing the world in some way. Uh, the innovation, it really needs to be truly novel, a paradigm shift. You can't just be adding a feature to something. You can't just be doing an incremental improvement. It needs to be, you need to swing for the fences. Um, is your approach, are you using the appropriate methods? You talk about alternate strategies, you have benchmarks for success. Um, do the investigators have a record of accomplishments and the appropriate experience and complementary expertise? They're gonna look for holes in your team. The way I see it is when you're building a grant, you need to cover, you're trying to like cover every inch of your grant in armor. Your reviewers are looking for a chink in the armor. They're looking for that weakness. Every single weakness, you need to anticipate it and address it. Um, this is a good formula for specific games. This is what I usually do. Aim one, I'm going to build something. I'm going to build part A, I'm going to build part B, I'm going to build part C. Aim two, I'm going to test it. For example, conduct a clinical trial. Do not shortchange that part of it. So this is a good way to organize it. You can do whatever you want, but this is how most of my grants follow this formula. The significance, uh, if it's a phase one, you should devote about a page and a half to it. This is very important that this typically one of the first things the reviewer is going to read. And you need to, you need to woo the reviewer and romance them and make them love you by being super clear and compelling. Use, use, think of this as like you're writing a novel and someone's right, reading the first few pages of your novel. Are they going to want to keep reading it? You have to put your best foot forward with your significance. Tell a compelling story. Anticipate their questions and give good answers. I write them so like my paragraph is set up so that it leads the reviewer down a garden path to thinking about a question. They're, they're, that question is now the topic of the next paragraph. You're, you're guiding them through the garden path. You really need to know what you're talking about. Cite scholarly references. Don't come and say you're going to build something in a space where you haven't done your homework in that space. And it's going to show. They're, they're immediately going to see that you, that you uh, don't know what you're talking about. Um, yes, I will be sliding my, uh, sharing my slide deck to the question that you just asked. Uh, innovation, one and a half pages, roughly. Major leap forward. Don't talk about too much here. Focus on a few key novel aspects. Trim it down, keep it laser focused on those things. Um, because otherwise it's too diluted. But they need, but it needs to be a big deal. It can't be. So I'm not saying, don't say you're going to do too much. But what you do say you're going to do needs to be uh, a major leap forward. Use concrete examples here. That's so important. If, if you're talking about things and the reviewer doesn't understand what you're doing, what you're saying, they're just not going to, they're not going to give you a good score. You need to grab them and ground them in something concrete. I love to include at least one picture for every page throughout the grant. A huge wall of text is hard to read for the reviewer. If you break it up with one good image per page, and be very careful that you, that you show the right kind of image, something that actually adds value, then a grant reviewers will really appreciate that. 
And, and you need in innovation, you need to compare very, very precisely and thoughtfully how your approach is different from what other people are doing. Then comes the approach, which in the phase one would be the rest of those six pages, three pages. Do not shortchange this section. Um, I like to organize my approach around my aims, say um, how we're going to do each thing, explain the key techniques. Don't go so far into jargon. Like some, a lot of times when I'm reading grants and I get to the approach section, unless you're a scientist in that specific area, you will have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, I do not usually treat that uh, favorably. Um, any reviewer who's, who's smart should be able to understand what you're trying to do here and, and how you're going to do it. Uh, it's very, very important that your approach has clear, measurable milestones, and you want those to be quantitative. Um, so, for example, uh, even, you know, four out of five uh, of the uh, people who are trying out our software are going to rate it at least a 80 on the sus, score, uh, the sus scale, something like that. You know, um, you, you need to make sure that you have that type of goal in there. Um, and also, what are the research questions and what are the expected outcomes? And you make sure that at the very end, you have a section where you talk about potential challenges and alternative strategies. Do not leave that out. Um, all right. Um, I know you don't need PhDs, but it's really useful to have them on your team with relevant publications. Um, I think we're out of time. So uh, I just want to mention that the bio sketches need to have, uh, they need to be personalized. So um, let's see if I have my bio sketch on here. Um, yeah, so so here's a bio sketch of one of my uh, one of my collaborators. And every bio sketch starts with a personal statement. This part, um, at least the first few sentences of it, need to talk about your grant so that it's not just generic. As a, as a reviewer, I want to see that this person is uh, committed enough to your grant to at least personalize their bio sketch for you. Uh, this is just a screenshot of a, a mind map. This is a tool that I use when writing grants, uh, which um, is so helpful. Uh, I, I typically work on the mind map before I even start writing the grant. Um, so here's the innovation section, here's the approach, here's the significance, and these are all of the um, sub uh, uh, subtopics. Each one of these eventually becomes a paragraph. Like about at this level, they're considered paragraphs. So this is my approach. I use something called Mind Manager or Mind Manager for this. Um, all right. Ricks, yeah. while you're still here, uh, I've had a question in my hand up uh, for a little bit. Uh, so oh, yes, you just put it out of the chat. Uh, you mentioned that you had several phase two awards. Can you estimate the average time uh, subsequent to the end uh, of a particular award, you know, when the product or service that was developed through the phase two, you know, achieves some kind of reasonable commercialization? Well, that totally depends on your business and um oh no i'm just asking for you uh oh. not in the, a technical sense but in the sbir you know the commercialization axis for sbirs because that is um you know something that uh, i'm a technical expert uh, that i have less uh, experience in um so, so is is your question, can you, can you restate the original question? I'm not sure I quite understand what you're asking. Sure. So you've been awarded, I think you said four phase twos. Um, yes. And, you know, you're funded to develop a, a product or a service, you know, that can achieve commercialization through, you know, the SBI or award. Yes. What, um, can you estimate basically, you know, how long from the, you know, either the start or the end of the phase two, that you were able to achieve, you know, some kind of reasonable, you know, penetration in some kind of market space. I see. Well, in our case, um, we got our first grant in 2013, and I would say we started achieving some reasonable commercialization in 2021. So, uh, you know, that's like eight, eight years. Um, right. uh, that being said, we did have a few early customers in 2019, 2020, but that was more just um, helping to shape uh, our our product more and, and get feedback from actual users as, as to uh, what their priorities are. Um, so uh, it, it really depends. Um, you know, we're trying to build, uh, in our case, we're trying to build a, a startup that will have uh, uh, 10, million, 10 million a year in revenue uh, in, uh, in the next five years, um, or maybe even 20 million a year in revenue. So can we, can we achieve that? I, I think we can. 
but um, you know, as far as the, the, the during the period where you're doing your your heads down research, you're not really focusing so much on commercialization. Um, um, but it is great to get started as early as possible to get grounded in that. So if you can get customers early, that that will really help steer what you're doing. No, um, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, I, so, I asked because the uh, the timing uh, for phase twos and even two uh, A, two B follow on types of things um, is typically not long enough to achieve some kind of a commercialization, and yet that is something at least in the DOE Office of Science uh, SBIRs um, is yeah. scored heavily. Um, yes, and I yeah. feel that you know it's it's very difficult. So I I'm a I'm a PhD physicist. I work for you know a very high tech uh, company developing electronics, and you know penetration into these types of markets, uh, which are dominated uh, by you know university labs uh, up to national laboratories, um, just takes a while. Yeah, absolutely, um, that is a uh, um, it depends on what industry you're in. In ours, you know it's um, software, so there's much less of a, a, a hurdle there, I think. If we build something good and we have good salespeople, we can go out and, and sell it directly to our customers. Um, but you know, if you're building a device or, or something that, that, yeah, it's, it's, it's harder to get there. Um, so uh, that being said, oftentimes you might be able to find investors to float you during that um, period where they say, oh, look, you've, you've gotten several million dollars in R&D funds. That was your seed capital. You built this technology. Now you have a good prototype. Let's get follow-on investment to uh, take it to the next level um, and, and bring it into the market. Um, so there is definitely uh, uh, a challenge there uh, when you're getting NIH SBIR compared to DOD that you have to figure out how you're gonna get there. And, and it helps to uh, partner with people who have industry experience, um, who have brought products to market in your space, either as consultants or bring them on to help you um, that's that's really critical. Um, I on my first journey through this, I, I was just a PhD computer scientist who had never really been a business person before. But I, I learned through that journey of, of what it means to be an entrepreneur and wear all the hats. Many times, a, uh, a researcher is not the right makeup for someone who's going to grow a business. Uh, those are uh, two different types of personalities. Um, and so you might want to, if, if you don't find yourself naturally uh, a salesperson who's willing to do everything uh, uh, that, that it takes to build a business, you, you might want to uh, partner with somebody who is. Understood. Uh, I should say that uh, I was a, a PM in the Office of Science for several years. Uh, and so, you know, as I said, I'm a technical expert, but the, uh, the other side of it, as you just mentioned, uh, is something that... Uh, is an acquired a talent and a taste, uh, as you yes. Uh, it takes a said. village. It takes a village to build a, a successful startup, and um, I happen to sort of bridge that uh, bridge that divide where I'm, I'm I'm a good entrepreneurial personality as well as a researcher. So um, um, I, I'm able to be the president and uh, CEO of my startup as well as the PI of the grant. But I think that that often that's not the case. Very good. Uh, very useful information. Uh, thanks a lot. Sure. Sorry, I had to rush it there and I went over. Um, I think we're significantly over time. Rex, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Do you have a template that you recommend on Mind Manager for that research plan that you did? Um, well, I have my own personal one that I use. Um, I can uh, I can probably uh, share part of that with you, uh, but you know it's 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 just a matter of um, having a, a topic bullet for each of the sections, one for innovation, one for significance, and then and then coming up with the main ideas uh, uh, that you, and and trying to organize it around the paragraphs, and then have make sure that the right uh, notes are touched in each of the paragraphs. And the reason why Mind Manager is a good tool is because it helps you to get organized as to how you're going to give your flow of your story. And, and, you know, I suddenly have it, like I have a, a point that I want to make, where should that point go? I encapsulate it in a, in a bubble in the mind map and I put it somewhere. And later I realize that's not the right place for it. And I can see the structure of what I'm going to write and I put it somewhere else. So it's just a way of organizing your thoughts. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Sure. Okay.
Thank you so much, Rex. That was super helpful. And I think everybody yeah. got a lot out of that. Um, yeah. I, I just want to end with uh, encouragement that um, I think NIH needs more new first time awardees. So uh, <laughs> there are a lot of things you need to learn through the process and don't necessarily expect to get funded on your first try. But I, I, I just really, I think that there's an acknowledgement that getting new blood in the system is really important for the vitality of the system. Um, and you know, there's a lot of these companies that have figured out the formula and they get grant after grant after grant. We're, I guess you could call us that, although we've only got these four grants. There's other companies that got 400 grants. So you know, we're not, we're not there yet, but having new investigators come in is, is important. And, and I think reviewers will, um, will, will give you more uh, favorable uh, treatment if they know that this is your first time. Uh, so uh, give it, don't, don't give up. And it's just so great once, you, once you're awarded, the feeling is amazing. And I wanted to throw out there too, like if, if you are experienced with SBIR, I think that a lot of these agencies are also looking for reviewers like Rex. And so maybe think about that as well, giving you that yeah. other side view. Yeah, usually um, they want the reviewers to be grant recipients. It's not a hard and fast rule, but I've tried to get some of my friends who are uh, really great scientists in a particular field and introduce them to the review committee saying, <laughs> here's someone who'd make a great reviewer, but they never ended up getting invited. I think it's because they hadn't yet got grants themselves, I think. I don't know what the, the criteria is, but I think they're definitely, it's supposed to be your peers, you know, reviewed by your peers. And that means like you're in the club, you've got a grant. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much, everybody. And hopefully we'll Thank see you. Thank you. I appreciate all your questions and your time. Good Thank luck, you. everyone. Um, you can reach out to me by my email um, if you want to, uh, uh, if you have any specific questions. Um, I constantly get people asking me if I would help them write or review their grants. I just don't have time for that right now because I am 100% in on my startup journey. Um, but I just, this is the best way I can get back to the community. There are some companies out there that do help people write their grants. Um, I can point you to some of them. I don't know how good they are, or how much they charge, but um, uh, they, they're definitely people who's ex experts in you know helping you navigate that process and not just writing it, but submitting it. Uh, that's one point is like I've hired people early on in this process for me to, to help me with the submission process. And that was money well spent. Um, I'll send out the this video link for everybody that attended. So you can rewatch it if you want. OK, thanks so much, thank everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.